I never, th- I'm, you know, times are always hard in government, but um, I never did think I would a- actually have to um, have uh, the Secretary of State for Local Government sharing something about flooding. Um, but um, one of the th- good things about the ghastly things that are happening in, um, in the UK at the moment in terms of flooding is I do think it has focused the mind rather properly on the issues that there are actually, that climate change is, is here, it is happening, and indeed needs to be recognised. And it's not just a thing that is happening, you know, in, this, in the stage of one, of, uh, one particular Secretary of State's sort of small earthquake in Chile, not many people killed. Um, it is rather immediate and really rather important. I'm, I'm not going to, I don't want to spend much time talking to you today. Um, many of you have heard me sort of droning on over the last five years about the sort of problems that I have perceived. And indeed, I think Ben and Phil are going to be sort of taking some of these on. But I think one of the things that I'd like to just sort of focus on very briefly is some of the work that was actually done, and you'll, you'll have seen that I'm now based a couple of days a week at the Oxford Martin School. And in the, um, <coughs> a few months ago, um, they published an international commission report on now for the long term, um, chaired by Pascal Lamy, many other, um, many sort of, of the great and the good in this world were actually on members of that commission. And they had some sort of fairly interesting things to say, which I think are really pertinent to the discussions today. The sort of things that they were able to illustrate, just for example, is actually really quite a dramatic decline in poverty in terms of some parts of the world. In others, quite far from the case. But give or take, there has been a massive decline in acutely defined poverty at the sa- in, um, in the last 20, 15 years or so. And many of you who are professional people in the development world will be aware of this. But I think also some of the issues that are coming up from that are that there is a, um, a really significant rise in what we would term loosely middle classes. And the, the, the commission report sort of details this rather well for individual geographical regions, but the projections of the increase in middle class and the current status is really quite dramatic. Give or take in the developing world, and again, one can query the definitions, about a billion people would be deemed as middle class, and through the consequent consumer um, behavior of people in that. Uh, But that's increasing by 100 million a year. So by 2023, um, we're going to be seeing something of the order of 2 billion people who will have the consumer uh, um, patterns of the middle classes. And manifestly, there is a bit of a difference between the middle classes in Central North America and the middle classes in Burundi. But these are big changes that are happening. And we need to be pondering those because, of course, the consequence both of the reduction in poverty and the increase in the in purchasing power of large sectors of the developing world means that you've got significant strain on the demand for natural resources. And if you c- couple that with the sort of thing that I typically have droned on about, this population change and urbanization, these things are really quite dramatic over a 10-year, 15-year time scale. And the sort of figures that we're seeing in terms of expected population growth for sub-Saharan Africa, something of the order of another 500 million people by 2025, um, increasing a pop- that population by 50%, and with most of these um, individuals living in, sit- living in urban in rather than rural environments, this is breathtaking in terms of its implications of how we actually address these. It poses the urgency, it doesn't go any way to, or to address the issues that Ben and Phil will be talking about, which are to do with complexity, but it is, quite dram- it is really quite dramatic. And, you know, one of the sort of, um, given Scottish devolution, I thought I would give a Scottish illustration to this. Basically, what you're s- or in the potential for Scottish uh, devolution, I should say, it is not a fact yet. Um, but the change in Africa is essentially in implying 
that we'll have a thousand cities the size of Edinburgh in the next 15, year, 12 years or so. And that is going to be quite dramatic. You know, hard to imagine. Asia, another 500 million people in the same period, but a population of four, of four billion going up to four and a half billion. Vastly less in terms of proportional change and the effects. And of course, and I've already mentioned it, you know, climate change is getting worse, or the implications of climate change are getting worse. One of the things that I just don't think have been understood well enough is the time delays in the climate system, that the greenhouse gases that were in the atmosphere in the 1990s are what are actually determining climate today, and that climate is, in this sense, determining weather. And we know the trajectory of uh, greenhouse gas emissions has been up since the 1990s. So looking forward into the future, pretty much what's up there now is going to be determining the sort of climate and therefore the weather for the next 20, 20 or 25 years. And that time delay is really quite important because it means even if you see some international action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and that is a very big if, um, you are going to be seeing worsening weather patterns. And the Met Office, Julia Stingo, their chief scientist, made the point um, over the weekend that we have got to expect this increasing severity of weather, and we've got to expect that the, the one in a hundred year event will be, tur will be turning out to be one in 10 years, or indeed five. And I do recall my first year in government was I was the chief scientific advisor and relatively naive when I heard three successive secretaries of state saying about different events, these were one in a hundred year events. Um, seemed to me that this was an, a fairly low probability event that you'd had three one in a hundred year events in three successive years, that you'll see that sort of rhetoric being used, but hopefully with some, um, with some rather better tempering of what in fact is happening. And I think that that is really to be, to be accepted. And I think we have the, I've talked about the UK, but I think the effect of Hurricane Sandy um, was really to address some of these issues on the, the, more the American public in a way that hitherto I don't think they had got linked in. So these, in a sense, these are the problems, these are the settings, there is some recognition, but don't kid yourself, this is an enormously difficult um, problem. And it is a problem for development. Um, it is a problem in which if we are going to get any improvement, um, there is obviously major political activities that have got to occur. But in a sense, you've got to be thinking about the way in which science, and I would include um, with science, science and engineering, and I would also include social science, needs to actually be thinking about how we can address these very complex issues. So that's enough from me. Um, I um, would like now to, um, rem I think Andre reminded you um, that you're, you're going to be um, on, t on film, but you also asked me to say, look, if you want to, to um, tweet about the experience, even if you want to say this is completely ghastly, Bennington said what he always says, <laughs> or something <laughs> like that, which I'm more than content for you to do. Um, the, uh, we are going, but do f feel um, you, uh, that you should tweet. Um, between the gaps in speakers, um, Ben is going to come next and I'll introduce him. But one of the other things that um, Andre would like to do is to actually make certain that you, you introduce yourself to the people next to you. Um, this, uh, this seems to me the sort of uh, speed dating in the development and complexity world that I feel very uncomfortable with. You know, I'm, you know I'm, I'm a very old man, as you can tell, and such things were not commonplace when I was younger and more interested in such things. But I think it's a good idea. Um, you are here. Um, this is a community. You've all chosen to come here. So I think that there is um, a really good idea to actually have a chance to actually say, I'm not going to sort of say you have to bond and shake hands and give each other a large kiss. That would seem to me a bit on the excessive side, but at least say who you are and maybe even uh, agree to meet or discuss something over lunch. So that's the sort of introduction and the bureaucracy of it. Um,
One of the things that um, I, I, of the benefits, and I am now a fellow, a fellow of the, this organization, and Andre was, one of the benefits was Andre gave me Ben's latest book, The, the Aid on the Edge of Chaos. And um, it's quite hard going, Ben. <laughs> it is not light reading. I would not go so far as to be pejorative and say it's a great aid to insomnia, which it is not, but it is quite challenging. It's, not, it's the sort of thing that you probably would like to read with a drink in your hands rather than actually uh, settle down quietly at 8.30 on a Sunday morning to read. But it's an excellent book. Ben has worked and advised lots of development in humanitarian organizations. He's worked for various UN bodies, the N various NGOs, he's worked for Red Cross, and he's worked for government agencies. Um, but I think the idea of thinking about complexity in the way he has in the book um, is really tremendously important. And I think it actually poses a challenge, whether that challenge is going to be taken up by the enormous bureaucracy that we, um, we face in the, develop in the development community and in the scientific and engineering aspects of development is a different matter. But pose the problem, it's got to be done. So with that, I'll pass over to Ben. Thank you. Thank you, John. And um, if, uh, if that was the worst thing that people said about my book, I'd be very happy indeed that you need to read it with a drink in your hand. <laughs> <coughs> so in my presentation uh, this morning, I want to echo my book, and I want to make three key points. First of all, that there are a number of cognitive and operational biases that have been observed by myself and others over the years in foreign aid that are increasingly at odds with the world that we live in, the world that we work in but which continue to exert an undue influence over what we do in aid, how we do it, why we do it, and how we report on it. The second point I want to make is that many of the problems that we face today in development humanitarian work can be rather better described, understood, and navigated using the ideas from the broad area of complex adaptive systems research. And the final point I want to make is that the approaches have considerable and increasingly proven relevance for the work that we do in aid in terms of providing better descriptions and explanations for a whole host of real world phenomena and indeed informing programs which can be more adaptive and more responsive to those situations. And thereby we can actually address the first problem I talked about. We can use these approaches to bust enduring but flawed assumptions and help to develop uh, aid work that is more relevant, more appropriate, more uh, catalytic, that makes more difference to the people that we purport to be helping. So let me begin uh, with an account of uh, what I describe in the book as an enduring myth in the annals of aid history. It's the eradication of smallpox. And it's one of only two diseases to be eradicated in human history, the other being rinderpest, which is a cattle disease. And What's interesting is the way that smallpox is eradicated, although smallpox is often talked about as being one of the major achievements of the World Health Organization and indeed the, the aid sector as a whole, the way in which it was eradicated is not widely talked about or understood in the aid sector. The main WHO website makes reference to a global mass vaccination campaign led by that entity. And it's typically described in very top-down ways. Uh, it involves a rollout of simple standardized processes moving from one country to the next in nice, well-oiled mechanical fashion and reaching optimal vaccination rates. There's a magic number of 80%, which historically helped to eradicate smallpox in developing countries, in developed countries. What's interesting is when you go into the historical accounts and the accounts of the people that are involved, you find that mass vaccination was not even, the, not, was not the only, but or even the most important aspect of the strategy. The most detailed accounts we have point to a rather different story which is only really partially acknowledged in the official history. And what these suggest is, contrary to popular belief, there were innovative and experimental approaches to the strategy around surveillance and containment that were far more important and helped to break the transmission chain of smallpox, even in those countries where less than 50% of people were vaccinated. And the, the, the successful strategy, which is typically presented as a success of top-down planning, a highly visible approach of applying vaccination, was in fact a process of emergent adaptive networked experimentation. Each country had to develop 
unique context specific approaches and even those involved in the campaign did not plan for or envision what the relevant approach would be at the outset. The campaign had to adapt and learn and adjust to context as Dan Henderson, the much lauded director of the campaign talked about. It was a continual process of evolution. And this learning process more than any other single factor has been described by those involved as the single most important contribution to the success of the campaign. Now, the, the director of the WHO in his speech announcing the eradication announced that it was a triumph of management, not of medicine. Now, apart from it being a very interesting thing for the WHO's leader to say about the, that organization's preeminent achievement, I think the comment also highlights a rather stark fact that the official history and the widely accepted narrative says almost nothing about the exact nature of this managerial success. Now, you might be asking why I'm telling this story. And what I would argue is that this illustrates something that's very widespread in aid, that aid institutions strongly incentivize the use of certain kinds of language, certain kinds of mindset, certain assumptions and approaches to explain and describe what we do in aid, what we want to do, what, how we do it, and what we did. And this applies even to tremendous successes, and often in the face of the available evidence. Now, the reason for this, I argue in the book, is that development and humanitarian aid institutions are shaped by and anchored in certain mental and cognitive models. And you can see evidence of this throughout the strategic, learning, performance, and organizational frameworks, all of which I examine in some detail in the first part of the book. And if I was to summarize this, we seem to think and act as if the economy, the natural resource systems we're exploiting, societies and the world as, as a whole are equivalent or, or analogous to a series of wind up clocks or car engines. We act as if we can predict and often exactly manage the behavior of the systems around us by breaking them up into manageable pieces and working on those pieces individually. And the role of aid leaders, aid managers, of policy makers is to engineer and construct change through reductionist analysis, prediction, planning, standardization, and control. And these assumptions underpin large amounts of what the foreign aid system tries to do, whether it's community development efforts or long-term uh, long statewide reconstruction efforts or governance processes or indeed large-scale uh, global health programs. Now, these are, these are implicit assumptions, but in the extreme, add up to a series of institutional and cognitive biases, operational biases. So let me just take you through these quickly. There's an assumption that the social systems, economic systems, natural resource systems are closed, that we deal with, are closed, ordered, and reducible to the parts that we're most interested in, while everything else is told, held constant. That these some systems are nothing more than the sum of their parts. There are assumptions about relationships that we can deal with individuals, institutions, entities, in effect as if they're independent and atomized, that their most important characteristics are to be found at the individual level, and that context and relationships between them are irrelevant, ahistorical, or can be reshaped and rewritten by external actors. About behaviors, that humans make rational decisions based on self-interest and that these behaviors can be specified in top-down ways and changed by simply changing the elements of this kind of elaborate calculus. And about change, that change is linear, additive, uh, that there's simple cause and effect, that there's a proportional relationship between inputs, outputs, and outcomes, and that more inputs should naturally lead to more outcomes. It's the world of nice straight line graphs and straightforward x, y relationships. Now, these ideas have their origins in 19th century physical sciences, and they found their way into organ organizations and institutions through neoclassical e economics, through scientific management principles, and through the uh, uh, idea of bureaucracies of the early, uh, early 20th century and the late 19th century. So these are the uh, assumptions, these are the ideas that Henry Ford used to deliver any colored car as long as it was black. And so perhaps unsurprisingly, they're most useful, they come into their own, they work brilliantly in situations where machines work well. They work well where there is a uh, straightforward task to perform, a stable context and operational environment, uh, identical duplicable product, compliant, reliable, predictable parts, which include the human component. Now hands up anyone who feels that their working environment resembles this picture. 
This is precisely how the smallpox campaign is often imagined to have worked. And this is a story that was told afterwards for many years and is still being told in many quarters. And it's the same kinds of assumptions that underpin the famously failed malaria campaign of the 1960s. This is a description of that campaign uh, written around the time, which mandated identical job descriptions in every country with precise charts to be displayed on every office at each administrative level. And the program being conceived and executed as a military operation which is to be conducted in an identical matter, whatever the battlefield. And interestingly, research was considered unnecessary and was effectively suspended from the launch of the program. Now, the, the smallpox campaign deliberately set out not to emulate the malaria campaign for exactly this reason. But the same kinds of assumptions underpin integrated rural development efforts of the same period, and they continue to shape what, what could be described as big aid. So if you look at global education initiatives, as recently described by Lamp Pritchard, the low-cost package of inputs that uh, the Millennium Campaign uh, assumed would be the key to achieving the MDGs, or the harsh reality of the Millennium Village projects as recently described by Nina, Nina Monk. Now, it may seem risible to say this, but this is the illusion, this uh, perfectly Newtonian world, that aid institutions, the, the aid counter-bureaucracy, as Andrew Maxwell memorably called it, demands be maintained in the face of the evidence. And the frustrations with this model are running at fever pitch across the bureaucracy that John described earlier, whether we're talking about donors or NGOs or UN agencies or national governments. Uh, a donor agency representative of a fairly senior level said, we don't actually want research or science. What we really want is simple problems with simple answers so we can demonstrate value for money. I think you said that as much out of frustration as anything else, but I think it's uh, really indicative of the way in which this, this model is being applied ever harder in the face of its failures. And I think uh, what's interesting is everyone from senior leaders to external critics are talking about the outmoded business model of aid. And I'd argue that this series of assumptions, in part at least, is what they're talking about. Now, I'm not saying that there's any individual that believes these things, or there's any institution that formally says these are part of the way that we see things. It's more that this is hardwired into how aid works. I think there are people that work in remarkably creative and innovative ways in the aid sector, but they often do this in spite of the institutions that they work in rather than because of them. And I think what the smallpox case does is it really powerfully illustrates how pervasive this is when one of the most uh, remarkable successes, which was a success of adaptive experimentation, is subsequently overwritten by tales of mechanistic standard operating procedures. So I think the reason this is so important is that if we continue with this addiction to reductionism, we risk learning the long, wrong lessons from our successes and not learning at all from our failures. Rather less portentously, um, I think the aid sector exemplifies Duncan Watts' memorable quip, likening the Newtonian model to a Shakespearean character. It's staggering around the global stage like a mortally wounded actor. And I think it's worth asking, given that every generation of aid critiques comes up with some version of this problem, from the 1960s, Albert Hirschman, uh, Robert Chambers in the 1980s, Bill Easterly in the noughties. Why does this model so steadfastly refuse to jive? I think in part it's because there are development problems, a small number arguably, that need to be addressed with exactly this kind of model, where exactly this kind of Newtonian reductionist approach is what needed. But to paraphrase Keynes, I think a more fundamental reason is that in the aid sector, at least, it's better <coughs> for individual and institutional reputation to fail conventionally within the confines of this model than it is to succeed unconventionally by moving beyond them. So let me move on to the second part of my talk. Um, the obvious reality is that development and humanitarian problems and the world at large are not like Newtonian clockworks. They're not like Ford motor cars. And growing numbers of experts have been pointing to the ideas of complex adaptive systems as an alternative theoretical model for development. And this is what I explore in the second part of my talk. And there's a history to these ideas which actually helps us grasp why and how they're important. The seeds of what many describe as the new complexity movement were actually sown 60 years ago by Warren Weaver, who was the science vice president of the Rockefeller Foundation. And I think he was a forgotten giant of the 
uh, 20th century scientific research. He did work on everything from uh, microbiology to anti-aircraft missiles. He, uh, he personally mentored over 20 Nobel scientists. So he was a very humble man. I think it's part of the reason why he was forgotten. I tell his story uh, to some extent in the book, but essentially, 1948, after the war, Warren Weaver found himself in a position not dissimilar to many donors today. He tried to think about the kinds of problems that his foundation, one of the leading ones in the world, should be trying to address. And as I just uh, hinted at, he was, a, he was a real polymath, so he was well-placed to do so. And what he observed was a significant gap in the activities of the foundation, and indeed in science and in policy community as a whole. What he found, what he argued, was that there were three kinds of problems in science, and that there'd been more progress on dealing with two of them than on the third kind. And the first kind are exactly what I've been talking about. They're kind of a, the problems that aid agencies are addicted to. And these are problems are of a few variables. So the trajectories of a rocket, Newtonian mechanics. Um, these kinds of approaches, this kind of scientific thinking, underpins many of the advances of the industrial era. So from transportation to germ theory to many forms of basic health provision. So, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with these problems. When I often find myself talking about the things that we got from the sciences of organized simplicity, it reminds me of the, uh, what did the Romans ever do for us scene in Life of Brian. But actually, what was interesting is in the, at the end of the 19th century, around the end of the 19th century, start of the 20th, scientists, uh, as Warren Weaver saw it, leapt to the other extreme and started thinking about problems of disorganized complexity. And these are problems of many variables, all of which interact in a random fashion. So the motion of atoms or thermodynamics, statistical mechanics, the kinds of uh, maths or statistics that's used in po population studies, or actuarial analysis, the kinds of things that insurance companies still use in order to analyze risk across a population in terms of cost base. Now, what's interesting, and what he identified in between the two, were problems of organized complexity. And these were not problems that could be broken down into one or two equations. There weren't problems that you could easily apply averages to. There were systems with a sizable number of factors that were interrelated into an organic and intricate whole. And so you can't, um, and the kinds of things that he talked about were commodity prices or economic development or the growth of cities or mass social media. And what he argued was that scientists and policymakers and funders had put much more effort into the first two problems and relatively little into the latter. And Weaver also argued that almost all of the major challenges that humanity fa would face in the rest of the 20th century would be of the third variety. And he called for what he described as a third great advance, which would combine multidisciplinary cross-scientific working with the power of what he rather touchingly called adva advanced counting machines to better understand and navigate these problems. Now, in part two of the book, I describe the progress on this advance specifically as it applies to economic, social, and political contexts. But what's really interesting is that Weaver has had quite a considerable influence across the intellectual spectrum. There's at least two Nobels in, Nobel, uh, uh, in economics, Friedrich Hayek and Herb Simon, who were highly influenced by his ideas and cited him in their Nobel acceptance speeches. Jane Jacobs, who is a, a perhaps the most influential scholar of the 20th century on urban issues, drew extensively from his ideas. And his, idea, his work directly contributed to the field of systems thinking, to machine learning, to the work of the Santa Fe Institute. Um, and at six pages long, it may well be the most concise piece of work ever to have inspired a new movement in scientific thinking. And many would argue that we actually now live in a world dominated by complex, adaptive systems with exactly the characteristics that Weaver described, that they are systems of many interacting agents and organization of agents. They're adaptive in that the agents design strategies and they evolve over time. And they're systems in the sense that the macro patterns emerge from micro behavior. So if we look around us, we can see ecological systems are complex and the costs of treating them as simple machines are self-evident. Climate is clearly complex and non-linear. The economy is complex at national and at global levels. Energy is increasingly complex. Like North America used to be the kind of standard version that people talked about when they talked about energy complexity, but actually you could easily refer to the UK or European systems and point to the complexities within those systems. Food systems, information systems, communities, organizations, 
they can all be usefully analyzed and understood as complex systems. Now, complex systems are vast in multifarious areas, uh, uh, and there's simply new areas emerging all the time. And in the research which I did, which I have to say actually, um, the initial work I did with Harry James, who's in the audience whilst at ODI, and then I then built on that work by doing uh, uh, more research at places like the Santa Fe Institute uh, and at the LSE. What we, and this kind of emerges really from the work that I did with Harry, and also uh, I kind of spell it out in the book as well, that you can identify some distinguishing features of social, political, and economic co complex systems. And by identifying that, we can get a handle on the problems within them. And what I've identified, I'm not saying these are the only approaches that are useful in social complexity, but these are the four main areas where there's been a lot of work done to date. And it's systems, networks, behaviors, and dynamics. And let me talk through these briefly. So complex systems approaches help us think about systems that are not reducible to one or two variables of interest. That essentially enables us to take a wide angle lens on the problem that we're dealing with and understand how they're shaped by feedback and interdependence. It helps us think about networks between people, groups, communities, products, as I'll talk about shortly, to understand the underlying structures of social, economic, and political relationships and how these change over time. It helps us be much more realistic about behaviours, about how we actually think and make decisions individually and collectively, and how in, uh, incentives and interactions shape our adaptive actions. And it sheds light on the real-world dynamics and patterns that we observe in the world around us, which aren't straightforward and linear, which where you can't hold one thing constant, but which are non-linear, which are characterised by tipping points and phase transitions and surprises. Now, these are all broad families of approaches. So within each one of these is a huge literature. Um, but what they do do is they help us better understand, and I would argue navigate, complex systems. And some of the uh, bona fide complexity scientists in the room will be keen to point out there are many more families of approaches out there. But these are the ones which I think have seen most application for the social settings, which are central to development. And what I try and argue in the book, and what I show in the book, is that together these ideas, these approaches, provide a, an alternative of modus operandi, the standard, stand, standard operating assumptions of aid that I described earlier. So let me just briefly close then by talking about how these ideas can be applied as a way of thinking about development differently. So in the book, there's over 25 case studies uh, across these different areas of aid agencies and aid individuals that tried new ways of thinking and working and who were able to achieve dramatically new, improved results. And they're to be found in every sector, from education to health to conflict to natural resource management. But because of the limited time I've got, I've just chosen one short case study from the area of network science to illustrate how complex systems approaches can be utilised in developing humanitarian aid. Now, network science, I mean, it is talked about a lot, the key thing is we're all affected by networks, by webs and relationships, whether they're social, economic or biological. And these networks are often invisible, but they can have profound influence on everything for us as individuals, on our mental and physical health, on our socioeconomic status, even on our life expectancy. Consider for illustration purposes uh, a small network of executives in a large petroleum organisation that was considering going through a restructuring. And what they essentially decided quite early on was they wanted to get rid of everyone below this layer here, William, Taylor and Scott. What they actually found, um, they conducted analysis and they tried to understand who was most central to work being done across this senior management team. And although this was the formal organisational chart, and in, in which the, this individual Cole would have been essentially let go of, this person was absolutely central to the conversations and dialogue that helped work happen. And this is a network analysis which actually revealed this invisible pattern. And so she, Ms. Cole was of central importance to the entire division, but you wouldn't know this from the or formal organisational chart. And for this reason, uh, social network analysis is often described as an organisational X-ray. It reveals patterns of connectivity uh, within specific functions and divisions or business units or across entire organisations. But it can also be used to reveal patterns of productivity, of, of energy use or flow, of political affiliation, of 
inter-firm relations, of gender equity, of disease spread. In the last two years, I've, done, I've led teams doing work on water sustainability in Ghana, on political affiliations in Uganda, and on uh, gender equity in Nigeria. So I think the potential applications are, are literally endless. The, the, the case study I want to talk about, and it's one that's had quite a lot of attention, is work done by Harvard and MIT, uh, which was led by Ricardo Hausmann, which is a former CEO of the Inter-American Development Bank, and Cesar Hidalgo, who's a network scientist and physicist. And what they developed was a network-based approach that formalized the idea of networks as being a really fundamental way of understanding economic performance. And essentially, what they've tried to what they've tried to spell out, what they've tried to do, is essentially start with uh, uh, the idea that much development thinking around economics doesn't engage very well with this idea of webs and networks. Such ideas run counter to standard thinking, uh, a lot of which tries to identify differences between individuals and groups or countries based on their aggregate qualities or their inherent qualities. So things like socioeconomic data for individuals or demographic factors or GDP. So experts then puzzle over why countries with very similar GDP might end up in very diff different development pathways over time, or individuals that seem to have very similar uh, socioeconomic status initially end up in very different places. What they actually identified is in many cases, the relationships and networks between these entities and within these groups proved to be a key differentiating factor. And if the data is available and it can be analyzed, it's possible to develop very precise and rigorous analyses of these differences and, and thereby explain them. So what Ricardo, Cesar and others found is that the structure of national productivity networks, what they call the product space, which I present here in generic form, provides a very powerful explanation for why countries, some countries, undergo economic growth while others stagnate. And essentially, this is a, a, a map of the relatedness of the products produced by a given country. And the, the different colours denote different kinds of products. So purple, for example, is medicines, and light blue is computer-related technologies, and so on. What they found was, having analysed a whole series of countries, and I'm simplifying their, uh, their story for, uh, for reasons of conciseness, <laughs> this, this network essentially conditions and shapes the development of nations. And by network analysis through network analysis, they were able to get a sense of the opportunities of development. Essentially what they argued or what they found was that similar, similar goods depend on similar institutions, similar inputs, similar factors of production, similar technologies. Uh, it was inspired by Ricardo's uh, observations of Peru uh, and the production of export of artichokes in Peru and how this created almost all of the conditions necessary for the export of asparagus. And it sounds, sounds uh, like a very simple example, but actually the soil conditions, the climate conditions, the packing technologies, logistics, the trade agreements, all of that added up, which meant that when Peru decided they wanted to diversify into asparagus and artichokes, they're able to do that very quickly by redeploying a lot of those original capabilities. But if they tried to move into an entirely new area like toasters, then the capacities they'd already developed would have been little or of little or no use. And that same principle, that very simple principle, is kind of could be applied to entire economies, that networks of productive knowledge underpin growth. And that it can be applied across entire economies to generate both data and powerful visualization. Now, what's really interesting is that this, this provides a new and important explanation of, of a classic development question that anyone that studied economics would have probably come across, or indeed people studying development studies at, uh, at the undergrad level. Why? Ghana and Malaysia, which started off in 1957 at, at the end of colonialism, as both largely rural, poor countries with very similar GDPs, why they've gone on such different trajectories. Now, Ghana is the first chart here, and Malaysia is the second. And the black squares indicate the area of the product space that, um, I don't know how I go back to that. Yeah, so they indicate the areas of the product space where their countries have a relative comparative advantage. And the bigger the square, the bigger the contribution to world trade of that com commodity from that country. And uh, I, don't, uh, I was trying to develop a kind of visualization which was animated, but was a bit concerned about the, um, the technological kind of failures that might happen. But essentially, Malaysia built on its agricultural base. The picture of Malaysia in around 1957, 1960 is not dissimilar to this at all. 
So what happened was that Ghana largely remained as it did in the 1960s, reliant on raw material exports. And they tried to diversify in ways that were suggested or uh, recommended by external uh, development organizations, moving up the supply chain very quickly, but those efforts were not sustainable. Malaysia, on the other hand, took much more of a kind of Chinese approach. You know, you have to cross the path, cross the river one step at a time, and you have to go uh, one stepping stone at a time across the river. And what they did was that they diversified by building on the things that they were already good at. And by use and actually, what's interesting is that they both started off with palm oil as one of their key uh, natural resource uh, ex exports. And Malaysia diversified from palm oil and started producing all kinds of ancillary things. So now, for example, chemicals and uh, um, electronics are all uh, being produced by Malaysia, all of which started off from their kind of agrarian base, whereas Ghana didn't do anything like that. So I think what's really interesting about this, this approach, um, and Ghana today is still largely reliant on raw material exports. I think what's really interesting is it brings analytical rigor to the complex and dynamic nature of economic growth. And it gives us um, the ability to answer long-standing and challenging questions much more precisely. And one of the developers, Cesar, summed it up for me. He said that the traditional approach to economics has retained measures that were developed in the 1930s and 1940s to deal with the situations and the crises that we faced back then. And what, me what they're trying to do is develop a s new series of measures which, which have much more precision and much more resolution. And that mean that we don't continue to build our analysis and our policy making and our practices on the oversimplification of complex systems. And I think it also points to a different approach when, it, when trying to promote growth, that you need to look to the existing product space, you need to see how it's evolved, and you need to see how the network can be continue to be evolved and grown rather than designed, that aid agencies need to be less architects of change and more like gardeners. And before you kind of think that's, you know, homespun wisdom, this is actually an incredibly powerful technique. The Economist described it as being better at predicting economic growth than any other available tool, including the World Bank techniques and the World Economic Forum techniques by a factor of 10. So it's, I think that's quite an astonishing revelation of how powerful this kind of approach can be when you've got the combination of the analytical tools and the data. Now, the key to this case study and all the others in the book is how the proponents, um, Ricardo and Cesar and all the others uh, in the, whose story I tell in the book, how they use these new ideas and data-driven approaches to challenge and transform our understanding of problems, uh, use the, that understanding to displace long-held and inappropriate assumptions, and if in effect, help understand the full diversity of problems that we face, that we, uh, there are some things that are indeed simple problems and we should be dealing with them as such, but also that there are a whole new series of lenses that we could be using on problems that are of organized complexity. And if we don't use those, we wouldn't fully grasp them. And if we don't grasp them, we can't pr properly address them. So the kinds of things that complexity research brings, I've already talked about, but I think it's useful to compare the two. So the kind of sciences of simplicity and what the science of complexity bring to our understanding. And I think, uh, I guess this is my, uh, one of my closing points, that really we can see this as a challenge or an opportunity. There are many people that I've come across and um, in many development agencies that actually say we what we need to do in the face of complex problems is apply the sciences of simplicity even harder. That at the bottom of these problems, you must be able to find an XY, XY relationship in an equation. And that actually, um, when I pointed out to them that that was a bit like a biologist that didn't believe in evolution, that, that just wanted to understand the functions of eyes or ears or limbs all separately, their response was, well, actually, maybe there are some biologists that don't need to believe in evolution, um, which I think is quite an interesting illustration of how entrenched some of these ideas can be in development. But I think, I think the, the key thing to say is that complexity thinking isn't the only way of busting these assumptions. It's not the only way of moving to the bottom row. And there are many heterodox social scientists, anthropologists, sociologists who will be keen to point that out. But I think it's one of the few ways that enable us to challenge all of these ideas at the same time. So all it, not just kind of what happens at the moment is that there's a little bit of uh, behavioral science tacked onto an otherwise standard model or a little bit of network thinking bolted onto uh, an otherwise kind of uh, typical way of thinking about the way the world works. 
What complexity thinking enables us to do is challenge all of these existing biases and issues at the same time. And so I think it has real potential to improve the way, way in which we think about and do work in AIM so that our work is, has much more fidelity to the world that we live in. And the key isn't the wholesale and unthinking application of complexity approaches, because as I said earlier, there are many situations in which the traditional approach has worked perfectly well. But we have to be able to work out the detail ourselves. We have to be able to find the hypotheses that are relevant for the problem that we face. And we shouldn't be turning complex systems research into a panacea on the one hand, or uh, an, uh, an excuse for our own pet project that we've been banging on about for years on the other hand. And I've seen lots of examples of both of those in the last few years. I think it's not about saying everything is complex. It's about saying we need to be more scientific in development. And we need to be drawing on the whole range of scientific tools that are available to us. We need to deal with complex problems accordingly. And when there are simple problems and simple models work well, we need to apply those as well as we can. So a couple of quick closing thoughts. I think um, just echoing John that the world that we face today is not the one that we expected to be living in 20 or even 10 years ago, characterized by uncertainty, unpredictability, John's comments actually made me think of the joke by Terry Pratchett that million to one chances pop up nine times out of ten. <laughs> that, uh, I, th I think there's a, th there's we're, we have this kind of cascading global crises. We have new and un unanticipated vulnerability and opportunities around us. And what's becoming ever more important from a public policy perspective is that we need new ways of thinking and new ways of acting if we're going to be able to better solve the problems that we've created if we're going to navigate the turbulent years ahead of us. And we cannot solve some of the ma major problems we now face using the mindsets we've inherited. So I think there's this new normal world that many talk about makes the goal of understanding and navigating complexity rather than simply dismissing or ignoring it ever more essential and urgent. And if we want development to be more relevant, more realistic, more scientific, this is a really important part of our topology. Let me, uh, let me close briefly by returning to the smallpox case and my favourite story from the campaign, apart from how it actually worked. Now, many of the heads of the WHO were actually deeply sceptical that the eradication effort would work. And in India, the most senior official went as far to say that uh, if the campaign was successful, he would eat the tyre from his 4 by 4 uh, soon after the campaign ended, Don Henderson, who was the leader of the campaign who I cited earlier, actually sent the gentleman uh, a jeep tyre. Uh, history doesn't actually reveal what happened to the tyre, but I, I like to think that the man was a, was a man of his word. And I'd like to think that he dutifully chewed e each mouthful of, of this delectable piece of machinery, and perhaps with some appropriate condiments, and that he would have reflected on the need perhaps to rethink some of his ideas, and maybe even change his way of thinking. I wonder if there might be an analogy there for AIDS mechanical addiction. It's an image I quite like, and it's one I'm going to close with. Thank you for listening. Oh, well, I was going to bring my iPad in, but it's not. At least it's just paper. Thanks, Tom. Um, well, I wanted, first of all, to say that uh, I was, when I received Ben's book, I was deeply impressed by it, not just as... Uh, a an, an, an illustration of how ideas in complexity can be applied in a in a detailed way to a real world problem and a very important real world problem, but also just as a general introduction to the the notion of what complexity means in thinking about our social systems. I think he does a fantastic job of explaining that, and has just done so again. And I just want to expand a little bit on um, why I think it is that thinking about social systems in general as complex systems has both validity and value. Um, and I want to touch uh, a little bit on the challenges that uh, this perspective poses, which, thank you, that's very wise, which, uh, which Ben has, uh, has already touched on. No one needs persuading that our societies and cultures are complicated. Um, what I want to emphasize is that asserting that they can be considered complex, complex systems, says something rather different. Um, and perhaps surprisingly, this assertion implies that they are, in some ways at least, uh, perhaps less complicated than might be imagined.
that complexity actually um, d tends to produce or can produce degrees of organization that something that is merely complicated do doesn't necessarily have. Now, there's a long tradition of claims that social science can never be really made into a science because human beings are just too complicated, too unpredictable, and too irrational to be described by behavioral rules. But as Ben pointed out, there's also a long tradition which assumes that social science is only the last bastion in a gradual conquest of the physical world by the approaches of Newtonian physics, and that it will, in the end, turn out to be just as rule-bound as the motions of the planets. Economists since Adam Smith have often succumbed to that view, sometimes to the extent of insisting that their theories must respect that view, regardless of whether the real world does or not. And in fact, I was really struck by how pretty much everything that Ben said in his, uh, in his talk uh, you could simply replace aid by economics and uh, you have the same story. Um, and I think that includes the fact that conventional thinking in economics sometimes works very well. The challenge is to find out when it does and when it doesn't and why that is. And in my view, the complex systems approach to social science seeks a middle ground between those things. It recognizes that there's already compelling evidence of regularities and patterns in human behavior, particularly when considered en masse. And it anticipates that more of these will emerge, but it also needs to confront the limitations of such a rule of such rule-based behavior and and needs to accept that there are some areas of social behavior that this I this view is, is, is sure not to fit very well at all. But what I think, what I think has been insufficiently explored so far um, is the question of what happens when is meets ought. It's fashionable these days, and I think it's long overdue, to point out that Adam Smith was, in the end, a moral philosopher, and that he never lost sight of, uh, in his account of how the economy works, of the fact that we must reach some accommodation between how things appear to happen and what we would like the outcomes to be. And in considering that tension, I know of no nicer example um, to sort of illustrate where we can go with this than the one that's now um, an, an old and very simple model. It was described over a decade ago um, to try to understand how people, how pedestrians move around space. And in fact, this was a computer model of specifically designed to uh, understand how people move around grassy spaces. And the reason why that was significant is that it allows people to leave trails of where they have walked. They wear the grass away. And then we have the potential for people to interact with each other. There's a feedback, there's an interaction there, which is at the root of all complex behaviors. And um, in particular, there, there then arises a conflicting tendency to either walk along routes that take us most directly from our point of uh, entrance to our point of exit, and a tendency to walk where we see other people have already walked, either because we think that must be the way to go or because it's just easier, because the grass is worn down or whatever. And researchers at Stuttgart set up a computer model of this process re which reflected this, these tendencies, and they looked at how the trails of the walkers evolved over time. So they initially had the, um, the, the walkers in this model walking over this grassy space, it's red grass here, I'm not quite sure why, and they're coming in and go coming out from the four corners of this space. Um, now, initially, what they found was that the trails that were worn down were the ones that just took the most geometrically straightforward routes between these different points of exit and, and entrance. But over time, these mutated into something else. They took on a less geometric and more organic appearance that in fact didn't offer the most direct routes between any of these entry and exit points at all. And those patterns do look, uh, did look rather similar to the ones that we can find in the real world. Here's an example from the University of Stuttgart, in fact, of a pattern like this that's just self-organized. Park planners know very well that these desire paths develop in parks, and wouldn't it be nice if we were able to predict them and therefore to construct them that way in the first place? 
Now, this is a, a trivial example, really, and in fact, I was delighted that Ben mentioned what have the Romans done for us, because I always remember 10 years ago, I guess it was, I was on the Today programmes, I found myself unwittingly debating what these complexity approaches might do for social sciences with a social scientist who was highly sceptical of the whole idea. And I began in the same way by talking about, in that case, traffic, which uh, can be modelled in a very similar way and saying, you know, this is just a simple example of, of how it can happen. And his response, he was channelling John Cleese, I think, his response could be paraphrased as, well, yes, of course, the roads, but apart from the roads, what has complexity ever done for us? <laughs> And I, th but that is, I think that is a question that we do have to ask. You know, how far can we take it uh, beyond these simple systems? But I, the real value, I think, as I say, is the metaphor afforded here. Because, first of all, this example shows that non-intuitive behavior that one couldn't have predicted in advance does seem to be amenable to modeling based only on some very simple assumptions about how people behave. And secondly, this kind of complexity-based complexity ba approach can grow realistic-looking solutions from the bottom up, just by assuming some simple behavioral ground rules. And third, there's, the, there's potential value in figuring out how people are naturally disposed and, uh, uh, and, and how they collectively seem to organize themselves rather than trying to impose some preconceived plan that they might well undermine anyway. And I might add that pedestrian and crowd models of this sort are only one small part of a broader move to regard cities and urban environments as complex systems. Um, and I suspect that this will be one of the most important areas uh, in which this complex system approach will start to pay dividends in the near future. I'm very glad that Ben alluded to the work of Jane Jacobs, uh, b who was really the first person to, to totally grasp this perspective as it applies to urban development. Um, the majority of people now, and this is a recent thing, uh, now live in cities, the majority of people in the world, and they're clearly going to keep on growing in the foreseeable future. And yet we've still only a rudimentary understanding, sometimes disastrously so, of how cities function and develop and grow. And what's more, this understanding has tended to evolve along quite distinct channels with li little interaction between them, so that, for example, transportation networks are considered in isolation from patterns of wealth and other demographic changes or changing modes of energy supply and distribution or problems associated with migration and climate change or planning for disasters and we can't afford to do that anymore to have that separation and you know if you needed a, a, an obvious example new, new orleans um, several years ago reminded us of why we need to integrate those different, all of those different considerations into the way we think about cities. And there are some people who are now really starting to recognize this and to build on it, and prominent amongst them are the, the folks at CASA at UCL, and I know that there are some people here from uh, that group, and I want to mention in particular these recent publications by Mike Batty uh, of that group, which make an eloquent case for why cities can and must be considered as complex systems. Now, Ben has explained why some problems in healthcare, such as the AIDS epidemic, also need to integrate a variety of different perspectives into a complex systems view. And I would go so far as to say that some of the most serious challenges in healthcare in the coming years are going to demand better understanding of social interactions and networks just as much as they are going to need better drugs and other medical interventions. Contagious disease is certainly one area in which it matters who we're coming into contact with and how we're moving around our environment. But there's also, I think, good reason to broaden the view of what contagion means to include the psychological influence of the networks, the social networks of friends and peers that we belong to. It's been found, for example, that smoking behavior is influenced as much by who we know uh, as much as it is by top-down campaigns of public information and taxation of tobacco and so on. Here, for example, there are two um, uh, small parts of, a, a, of, so of real social networks um, 
that connect people who smoke or who don't. Um, so one is from 1971 and one is from 2000. And here, the, the large yellow spheres denote the smokers. And so you can sort of see straight away that one good uh, uh, message is that smoking is declining. Um, but it also shows you, you can't immediately see this by glancing at it, but you can see it by analysis, that the smokers that remain form small clusters uh, that reinforce each other and that also tend to appear towards the periphery of these networks. They're the ones that are hard to reach, uh, that are hard to get through to. What's more, this sort of social contagion, which of course can spread good as well as detrimental behaviours, this is also found, uh, has also been found in levels of obesity. Uh, people who uh, are more likely to become obese if their friends and peers do. I, I, and th it, it is clear that that's not just they happen to be, uh, they happen to know people who are also obese. It's that the, the process of becoming seems to be influenced very strongly by what the peers are doing. And this suggests that tackling these health problems can be more effective if we understand how behaviours like this propagate on these networks. And there are emerging reasons to believe that Antisocial activities such as crime share similar attributes. And I could go on talking, for example, about how approaches like this, bottom-up modeling and thinking about complex systems, are also being used to try to understand the causes of things like political extremism, terrorism, war, and economic crises. There are good reasons in all those cases to hope that something of real value will be achieved, but there's also an evident danger of implying that all of the world's ills are somehow going to be vanquished by this kind of thinking. The fact is we simply don't know yet how useful it will be in identifying new and more effective solutions. The technical questions uh, about this sort of approach are recogni well recognized, at least in principle. For example, how do you evaluate the uniqueness of your model? How can you test your model against real data? How far can models be predictive rather than just descriptive? And so on. Some of the, the harder questions are ones that Ben has already mentioned, but I think uh, bear reiterating. And here, the, the key issue is this tension that I mentioned between ought and is. Probably no one is going to question the value of having models that allow us to design better, more amenable, safer public spaces and highways. No one's going to complain about approaches that can alleviate crime and war. But I think that one of the big challenges is going to be to avoid this complex systems picture becoming just another prescription for justifying preconceived top-down goals, much, uh, much as, as conventional economic theory has sometimes been commandeered to support particular regulatory regimes, or, or rather lack of them. And even setting aside the question of who decides what the goals are, there's the big question of whether bottom-up descriptions of social behaviour can ever become reliable enough to enable the system to be engineered in some way by tweaking the ground rules towards a particular outcome that we might have decided is a desirable one. Can we do that? Perhaps what's really needed to, to enable any aspiration like this is uh, a, a just a change in thinking. One of the great advantages of complex systems, uh, for example, is that they are adaptive. When new circumstances arise, new and hopefully better adapted behaviours can result. And their problem-solving methods can be iterative. You don't necessarily get things right on the first attempt, but using this sort of approach, you can learn from mistakes. But that's only possible when mistakes can be seen as opportunities for learning and not as policy failures. I don't think we have yet a political or an institutional culture that permits that way of thinking. And I suspect that's what we're going to need if we're going to exploit complexity thinking to its full potential. Thank you. Well, just to slight warning, um, I have a reputation of being slightly Stalinist in my chairing, um, but I but now we'll open it up. up. Um, I d have we got microphones? Or yeah, okay, we've got microphones over there. Um, could some could a couple of people sort of make certain they've got them?
Um, what I'll do, um, there is a sort of uneasy tendency for people to speak for five or ten minutes. I would just ask you to say we've got half an hour and think of the arithmetic. So the, a reasonable democratic allocation of your time would give you about four seconds. <laughs> um, I will not impose that because people will bring forward. So um, first turn. Yes, you, sir. Uh, Stephen Bishop first. Thank you. I'm Stephen Bishop. I want to defend my answer to this question that Philip posed. That is, <coughs> how much of aid is driven by accountability? How much does accountability uh, dictate how people react? Okay. <laughs> well, we'll take two or three in the questions, but somebody may want a statement. Yes, you, sir. And I'm not going to stay on this corner, I promise. It's just that not that they just caught my eye. Please. Well, I, I think the, the, the sen is this microphone on? And could you just say who you are? Uh, my name is Dennis Brown, Jordan. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think the, the central theme of this meeting is um, about problem solving. In other words, I want to put forward here that uh, an, an issue or problem of this uh, stage will be converted into some kind of an alleviation of this stage. Now, this is a universal activity of hu of um, of living things. Without this activity, they couldn't be done. And it is of common of gravity in uh, the material world. Now, the question is, what converts this initial stage into a final el uh, acceptable stage? And it is the, f the idea of purposive systems. We can wait for chance, as, is, as in uh, natural evolution, but that would take mil millions of years. Now, we have seen in this meeting as well how diverse and fragmented the various opinions about the activities of this system, which is as universal as problem solving. So how can we reconcile this fragmentation of views and this diversity about a system activity which is universal. So where are the fundamental universal principles? Where is the symbolism that enables us to model this system? Mm. And this is the challenge okay. that um, I'm throwing open. And Very I helpful. I have got uh, some suggestions. Okay. Well, we will. I'm sure you'll have the opportunity to give your suggestions, but I'll pose the question to. Um, these two first. Well, have one more and then I'll look for – thank you. I'll have one more question and then we'll look for it. Um, yes, young man with a beard next to a dark-haired lady in the fourth row. Thank you. I think um, one of the – Could you say who you are? Sorry, please? yeah. Uh, my name's Rob Levy. I'm a researcher at CASA UCL, just around the corner. <coughs> um, uh, I think one of the difficulties of complexity science is that um, – it's hard to do. Uh, we're working with large data sets, and that is kind of in itself a skill. And we're also working more and more with network analyses, and that certainly takes a bit of background and a bit of uh, know-how. So I suppose my question is, is it, is it reasonable to expect social scientists to, to work with something for which there's no command in Stata? Okay. Should you, is that cl reasonably clear? Sorry, what I was the last I question? Is there's no stata. It's a, so, so social scientists use uh, a tool called Stata, which is um, for statistical analysis, and it's nice and easy because mm -hmm. every single thing that you do has its own command. So you don't need to really learn how anything works. You just type it in. Uh, complexity science doesn't have such a, a toolkit yet, as far as I know. Okay, thanks. Well, I'll pause now, and we'll have um, Stephen um, kick off with you, Ben, and then to you, Phil. Okay. You've got two questions. Okay, great. I'm gonna I'm gonna tackle the second one, the third really, so maybe leave the second one for Mr. Levy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I'll try and speak to all of them. But uh, on accountability, it's quite interesting. You know, the smallpox campaign is is an interesting example of exactly this issue, where John Henderson famously said that the only way he was able to successfully oversee the eradication of smallpox was by breaking every rule in the WHA book. Um, John just said to me before we started speaking, before the session started, that he's a big believer in doing things first and apologising afterwards. 
I think I think there's a there's a there's a real issue here around um, the experimentation that's allowed in aid, and I would say there's a diminishing space for that, particularly as aid budgets are increasing, um, and and a need for a kind of top down accountability that reinforces this simple linear proportional view of the world, and, and I think the the way around it or the way to navigate it, which I think is what uh, uh, underpins your question, is actually there are many contexts, many problems where that way of working just simply doesn't work. So um, a, a, a lot of people talk about the need for bed nets to deal with malaria. Now, that's mm. a really good example of narrowing down the problem. Malaria is an ev evolving problem, and it's uh, we I think some, somewhere, somewhere in the region of 1968, we were talking about almost eradicating malaria, and uh, should we say <laughs> the death of malaria was rather overstated. Um, it evolved, it adapted, it's become a much bigger problem. Uh, a lot of aid agencies try and define that problem in the context of have we got bed nets for everyone? Because that's a problem we can actually solve and you can uh, demonstrate some kind of upward accountability. But actually, the Lancet recently published an article which showed that if you go back to the places where bed nets were distributed five, six, seven, eight years ago, in many of those places, malaria is actually resurgent again. And so that's one way of dealing with it, to show that that accountability isn't a lasting accountability, but it depends whether or not you want a sustainable solution to a problem. And the other thing is to say that in many contexts that aid agencies operate, fragile states, many of the issues that they're trying to deal with, like resilience or economic growth, that kind of accountability also isn't relevant to the problem. So you need to try and find ways of enabling aid agencies to experiment. And the classic way that that has been done to date is to say we will sign money over to the private sector because they're more innovative and more experimental. But actually, I suspect that's not going to be a lasting solution to the problem. And that um, institutions may need to get together, and this may be a problem for the public sector as a whole, to find more adaptive ways of, of operating. And we do do it. I mean, government subsidizes uh, investment in in developing new drugs, for example, where they know they don't know what the outcome is going to be, but there is some somehow some political equation that's allowed to say we are allowed to experiment with taxpayers' money in that setting. And I think what we need to be able to do in the development development context is to say there are some problems where we need to be able to take a more experimental approach. We can't simply just absorb the accountability frameworks you're imposing on us. I think you're I think you've answered the question pretty well. Let's give Phil a chance. Well, I, I guess it strikes me that maybe the second and the third question are n touching on the the issue of whether there is such a thing as a complexity science that somehow you know exists or will be created and that will then just be applied to this problem and that. Um, is that a sensible way to think about it? And I know people who work in these areas uh, uh, worry about that problem and don't certainly don't seem to have any consensus about it. You know, is there just a standard toolkit of, of principles and ideas and approaches that you can then sort of, you know, crank out um, to, to this problem or that? I think we just have to say at, the, at this stage um, it, that it's not at all clear um, whether there will be or not. I suspect that that probably isn't going to be the way that it's, it's going to happen. But I do think <coughs> that there are... <coughs> some uh, generalities that one can make about um, many of the different systems that have been looked at in this way. And among them, I just wanted to, one that sort of springs to mind, John began by talking about uh, the how what were previously thought to be rare events are going to be more common. And actually, that is a, uh, a very common observation in any sort of complex system, that actually th they're not... Uh, they're not necessarily rare events because the, the very statistical distributions that you find in complex systems are different from those in random systems. You don't get a Gaussian distribution. This has been this this, this has yeah. caused some problems in economic th uh, in economic uh, thinking, where you know uh, what are supposed to be sort of rare events have uh, have have caused collapses and. I think it's becoming clear that in complexity you need to be aware of the fact that you just have different <coughs> statistics to deal with and that rare events uh, are, you know, are no longer so obviously rare at all. 
I think that there's also the observation that things change discontinuously. I think this idea of discontinuous change, of making a small change in the, the circumstances <coughs> um, of the system can, can create a big change in the, the outcome. So this is something that, uh, that we see um, you know, in, in, in many different systems and that physical scientists have thought about using the concepts of phase transitions in the past. So you know, these are just two generalities that seem to emerge, and I'm sure there will be others. But I would be wary about you know, turning those into some kind of toolkit that you, know, you just then sort of plug in to solve your particular problem. Okay, um, do you want a last wor word, uh, Ben, or shall I go to another question? No, I guess uh, on the point of it being hard to do and the need to work with large data sets, and is it reasonable? I mean, I, I think the, the there is a lot of investment in development research, and a lot of it is reinforcing this kind of uh, uh, what you might describe the standard operating model. I know the UK government, for example, in 2010 announced that they would be investing a billion pounds in research over the decade to come. That's, that's, no, that's not, not small amounts of resources. And I think one of the challenges for this area of work is it's not systematically been funded by development. I, I don't know who funds CASA, but I think it's the EPSRC that's funding your work rather than DFID itself. So I think uh, it's quite interesting. I think there's a challenge there around how we actually support this work if we're going to make it relevant and useful in policy contexts. But I think there's also a, a kind of an underlying point here as well that the um, uh, there may be an analogy to draw with game theory. So game theory was developed in the 1940s and 1950s, and it's got all kinds of different applications today. Evolutionary game theory, uh, uh, lots of different mathematical applications of game theory, which are really important and useful. But there are also a number of principles that you can internalize from game theory, having uh, rules of thumb that help you make decisions better. And I think you need both. You need to be able to invest in both the uh, the, the hard science, the, the data-driven approaches, and you need to be able to work out how that can support better decision making. And I think I think that's an area where you need also need resources, so that when clever people like you come up with these apparatus and, and tools and approaches, we can actually find ways of saying, and this is what it means. Okay. Um, and I, th I think we need investment in both sides of that. Okay. Other questions, right? Um, there, you two, I think you were trying to get the floor right with the first round, so I'll go to you next. Okay. I've just heard a wonderful series of presentations, but let's look at the problem and say, can we stop things modeling solely after the event? Yes, we learn by it. ability that we have to think ahead, foresight, anticipation. Why is this relevant to effective use of energy? Because of the greater complex adaptive system that nobody can tackle yet in human thought. We like to argue, disagree, challenge, experiment, and be creative. Have the ability to support this problem solving by thinking it in advance. Okay. But it all happens at a meta level. Thank you. I think that's a statement rather than a, rather than a question. There's two, qu two, be two, o two people over there, a gentleman and then after him, the one at the end of the row. Hi, um, Harry Jones of IDI. Um, so I, I think that there's been some talk, you know, we need to develop new solutions, we need to invest in the research. Also, for me, I think there are some pretty simple things, pretty simple lessons that come out of complexity about being flexible, about building on, building on what's there. Um, what's your advice, Ben and Phil, for, for those of us who work uh, advising uh, aid agencies? Uh, where's the biggest bang for the buck? And just to give an anecdote, uh, I've been working, uh, helping, helping a certain agency do a lot of program design recently and it seems like these exercises go six months, nine months, some of them even try and incorporate complexity related uh, analysis into it but then as soon as the money is released there's, there's been nothing to fund it and, the, and the, the bang for the buck versus of additional uh, money going into planning versus 
good, very simple principles about being flexible when you're when you're implementing and learning, when you're implementing and being engaged, when you're implementing the program seems to be yeah. So where do you think is the biggest bang for the buck? And then what what what's your advice for those of us who work in okay. or advising all those sort of people? Thank you. Um, we'll pause that one and then get an answer from you two in a minute. You first, please. Hi, um, I'm Lucio Osorio from Practical Action. Uh, a big part of my life uh, I spent trying to connect frontline practitioners with uh, these sort of discussions and topics, and in particular complexity is one of them that's been very important for me in the last year. Uh, I wanted to know a little bit more about the sort of knowledge and behaviors uh, in the f uh, at the level of frontline staff. Um, I don't know, Ben, for example, taking some lessons from the uh, the uh, uh, smallpox case you gave. Um, that's That seems to be a very important issue because I think we should try to avoid overburdening these people in the front line with theories and methods that maybe they don't need to know about, but, um, but if that's the case, then what what's the type of knowledge and behavior we need at that level and how how we connect those people with scientists and other levels of uh, donors and practitioners um, okay. to make it work. Okay, thank, thank you. you, that's very clear. Right, I'll go to there and I would just comment that the gender balance is a little curious in the questions at the moment um, and that is not due to my in innate <coughs> bias as being an old man with a beard. So over to you, Glenn, and then these two. So uh, I think it, the point about only really you find these tools after the event or approaches after the event is really interesting. I think there is a big gap in what we do in development and humanitarian work generally. Um, not exactly related to foresight, or take, although I think foresight is really important and we do need to get better at foresight. But actually what you get is a lot of um, uh, design work, a lot of investment in theories of change and trying to get the program right up front. And then a lot of investment in evaluation and the kind of weak piece in the middle is what we call monitoring. And actually, th 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 what's really interesting, the government has a network um, called uh, around operational research, which is at, uh, in the UK, it's the Government Operational Research Service, which is the natural home for a lot of these techniques in, in across Whitehall. So it's where a lot of systems thinkers reside, it's where a lot of network scientists get together to talk about how they can apply these approaches. W what's really interesting is when they called a meeting last year of the re operational researchers, and I tried to get into this meeting because there's some work I was doing with the UK go uh, de de Department for International Development. They said, oh, we don't, we don't invite DFID because DFID doesn't do any operational research. It just commissions. And I think that's quite an interesting, and, and then trying to actually look, that, and if you look across the board, that there is some effort being done in implementation research by the WHO, usually to try and work out how vaccines can get better down the down the chain, but actually we d we're not particularly good at operational research. It may be that we don't have the resources for it. I mean, the operational research really grew out of military science where you could have the equivalent of people going off in the back seat of a, of a, of a plane and seeing how uh, pilots were responding to different situations. And the military have got the resources to, to spend on this kind of thing. But the fact that there isn't nearly enough and the fact that every evaluation that you can care to mention would highlight the fact that there was insufficient monitoring data for them to be able to use it to understand how the program really changed. I think th this point about only doing the research after the event is really important. We need to be able to address it. Can I pause you there and let Phil answer one of the questions? Well, um, it, it, it seemed to me that most of those questions were about specifics of aid that I think Ben would uh, uh, would be much better place to, to handle. But what one thing that did occur to me that perhaps several of them touched on is that I think, and you know, John began by talking about climate change, and I think the some of the lessons that are still being learnt within the uh, climate uh, modelling community are ones that are very relevant to, to this situation in terms of things like how you evaluate uh, your models, um, you know, wh what sort of, can you get the data that you need to connect a model to, uh, to what you see, but also then unraveling cause and effect. And I think that's one of the most difficult things. Um, 
it's it's you know what you're often faced with in complex situations like this is correlations between data sets but that of course doesn't tell you what is causing what there are techniques there are mathematical techniques for teasing out some of that information that a bit that have been developed in in climate modeling and uh, you know i think will hopefully be portable in some degree to social systems but uh, I guess all I would say is that I think there's a lot of there are a lot of similarities between the two, and that climate modelers have had to confront these questions already. Of course, also about this question of prediction, of you know that's really what we want to know. Um, and so I think that, you know there's a lot to be learned from from what they've done. Okay, Ben, uh, your two you two specific questions really on the, sure. on the rest. I guess, um, Harry, thanks for the question about um, the, you know, the simple lessons. I think you're right. I think um, the challenge is, unless you've got people at a sufficiently senior level within the organization, they're not going to be able to create the space f for flexibility. And then the standard accountability mechanisms, uh, you know, the kinds of things that, that Steve was hinting at, are going to bleed in and actually, uh, however good the analysis, they're going to start demanding certain kinds of results over certain kinds of time frames. And I think... The way in which we've tried to address this in um, in a couple of operational agencies that I've been working with is is to really talk about the issues that uh, the leadership are obsessed by. So many international agencies are now talking about wicked problems at the leadership level. Wicked problems, actually, the literature on wicked problems is um, quite long. It goes back to the 1970s. It was arguably influenced by Jane Jacobs' work on what kind of problem a city is, which was inspired by the stuff that Warren Weaver wrote about. But they are talking about com how leaders deal with wicked problems, and I don't think they have spent enough time thinking about how institutions deal with wicked problems. Um, so I think the, uh, there's, there's, the, there's this kind of um, emerging gap, this kind of relevance gap between what aid agencies are being asked to do by political forces, whether it's the kinds of challenges that they face and what they're actually having to do in practice. And the the kind of the place where that gap becomes most apparent is between the kind of design and implementation side. And what it actually means is that um, and the implementing agencies may get a little bit distorted. It's what you need are better partnerships for delivering development outcomes, which where you don't have simply commissioning agencies. Because if you're advising a commissioning agency, they may well just need a log frame. And they may just want to need, they may only need <coughs> the numbers at the end of the day to inform that design approach. If you, uh, if you, therefore, you need a commission agency that has a different kind of approach, a different way of engaging with the implementer. And, and at the heart of the problem that you're talking about is the thing, the principal agent problem, that you've got a principal that says, we want development to happen, and they pay a, a middleman to bring it about. And actually, we need to change that model because there are many principals, there are many agents. And many of the problems that we face just aren't amenable to that way of doing things. And I think you have to start with the leadership. So if there's a bang for buck anywhere, it's about advocating to leadership about the need to address this. Um, a lot of them will obviously be resilient. The, the point on frontline staff, I think one of the, you know, I've written about this uh, uh, over a number of years. And one of the continual bits of feedback I get from people at the front line is, thank you for providing a language and a, t a way of talking about my day-to-day -day experience that actually resonates with what I do, rather than finding, uh, uh, rather than the tools and approaches that are imposed on me that I have to, <coughs> in a sense, invent the language to mm. spe uh, speak to the architecture. So I think um, to actually uh, highlight, it's, it's those rules of thumb or techniques that enable us to be more adaptive to understand uh, these approaches. I think that's really important. The other thing for frontline staff is almost any element that they do has some degree of participatory research and I think there's there's a lot of uh, space for participatory methods to bring in these elements so participatory network analysis for example working with um, illiterate farmers has helped reveal the pathways to economic development the ways to get around middlemen the way to get um, smallholder farmers to routes to markets for example okay um, ben, I think that, that, that's so there are lots of ways in which you can support that without overwhelming them with science. Right, be warned, I'm going I'm to take uh, female questions now. Um, this lady here, followed by this lady, and then is there a third lady? At the back. No, here, right. Okay, so there's your, your over to you. Hello, I'm Laurie <coughs> Gao from uh, Regent's University, London. I'm just wondering, where do you see these actual experimentations? Because to a large extent, the innovation will be bottom-up, because that's in any complex system. 
So where are the skills that uh, allow practitioners on the ground to really move from analysis of phenomena? So if you're talking about studies or traffic or epidemics, this is an analysis of a phenomenon, but not an analysis of an actual challenge. And if you allow people on the ground to actually look at the challenges they need to take on as a complex challenge, that allows them to actually incorporate accountability and other constraints that exist within their working environment as part of that system. So is the fact that we're looking at complexity simply in scientific terms rather than in operational terms actually uh, prohibiting innovation on the ground? Because the aim of the model is not to describe an objective reality, but a model that allow you to operate better. Thank you, very clear. Yes, ma'am. Ma Hello, um, Ms. Barber from Cambridge University. Um, I was interested to hear Ben talking about the sort of social movement towards the middle classes. And I would say that that was actually, was that you, Phil? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it was John. <laughs> 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 I think it might be me. <laughs> but uh, I think you've all described a sort of the, 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 the movement towards a sort of a more wealthier um, society. Um, but I would, I, what I didn't hear was about the negative controls that actually exist within society that keep things as they are, the sort of ne negative feedbacks which try to um, get the sort of um, investment return on people's investments that are holding systems um, in stasis so that we can't allow the adaptation that a complex system would actually drive. Um, and what I'd like to suggest is maybe in order to change mindset about becoming adaptable and flexible, that actually we push education down, not just to doctoral students, but even lower than master's students and get the p people doing degrees in complexity so that we're actually getting that mindset into people so that when they become the policy makers and the CEOs, that they have this mindset that allows adaptation. Thank you. Also very clear. And you, ma'am, yes, to your right. Hi, I'm Maggie Ibrahim of Broadbridge in the UK. I love the, um, the topic and the conversation presently. Um, I've struggled with this personally um, in two fronts. One is, does complex adaptive systems, can you be interventionist in this way of viewing the world? Um, and should I just relinquish that interventionist mindset? And then the second is about um, the kind of intuition element and what we need to support for frontline staff. I think it goes back to Lucio's question. Is there a way of framing some of this rather um, more in, in terms of a philosophical conversation rather than such an interventionist. And do you think that might help? I'm just, one, I'm just wondering. Okay, because th th the standardized doesn't seem to be moving very quickly in development. Okay, right. Um, arithmetic here. We have five minutes. And there's two of you. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll be very quick on... Um, the point about education, I, th I think that's right. And the Santa Fe Institute, where I've spent a couple of stints whilst writing the book, actually gets people, uh, kids in at the age of 13 to 16 to learn about these tools and techniques. So I don't think you can dig in early enough. The, the point at which people start learning about science, I think, is where that you can actually introduce these ideas. And I think that that is um, a really important element. Whether or not that's sufficient to change the dynamics within society is another question. Um, Orit's point about um, uh, whether or not a science-based approach, I guess I guess I, uh, my starting point was science because it, it seemed to me that we needed to be able to describe the world better if we uh, and understand the world better before we can really um, uh, try and influence it. And, f and indeed, m one of the ways in which I was trying to uh, piece together the, the puzzle of complexity was trying to look at all those different settings where aid agencies had been doing things which are inappropriate, where the inevitable feedback loop in the system was basically coming back, and that was kind of the starting point. I don't think it has to be uh, a pure scientific question. Uh, the operational research stuff which we've been looking at um, with DFID has been looking at, for example, trade, uh, cross-border trade in northern Nigeria and the dynamics that influence that. It's a very operational question, and it's a way of saying, well, where do you invest your resources? when you've got multiple possible entry points, what you want to do is to try and create the conditions that can enable poor female traders to go across the borders better. So I think it, it all, all depends on, you know, define the question first and then bring the appropriate methodology. And if you find that complexity tools can be relevant, then great. And if not, then leave them to one side. Um, on the point of uh, 
interventionist. I, th I think it kind of depends on uh, the, the problem and, and the way in which you're doing it. So, for example, there have been people that have used nonlinear dynamic analyses, uh, nonlinear epidemiology to develop better programs for, uh, for vaccination and more adaptive, responsive programs. Measles has been the being the classic example, it's a poster child for nonlinear epidemiology. It's a massive issue in Niger, many parts of the Sahel, and the standard approach to vaccinate after an outbreak doesn't actually do anything at all. And the w MSF brought in uh, a, a number of mathematicians to sit in their operational offices in Niger and actually get the data, crunch it real time, and show the kinds of interventions that would be better. And the actual intervention, it just needed to be a little bit more responsive, a little bit more adaptive, and a, a bit more uh, reflective of what was actually going on. So I think it can be uh, in used in interventionist ways, but I think you'd always have to be thinking about the implications of that. At the moment, we tend to act in interventionist ways as a kind of knee-jerk, we need to intervene. And uh, in many settings, I mean, I know you do work on resilience, for example, and we talk a lot about now how we build their resilience. That's completely daft. Communities are resilient or they're not. We can support them to be resilient, but even in this country, we find it very hard to build the resilience. Um, on the philosophical point, I think my, this is my only philosophy sh joke. Uh, I know Foucault about Derrida, um, but uh, uh, but um, but actually, I think I think that there may well be um, useful things from philosophy. I'm not the person to really respond to that. Um, uh, I guess maybe that there's a, there's a Th there are as many things to be drawn, there are many disciplines we could draw from. I think the social psychology of AIDS is one of the really interesting ones. That uh, people, why people get into the AIDS sector, what it says about them, uh, and maybe there are philosophical elements there that we should all be spending a bit more time examining. Great. Okay, Phil, and then. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be very brief. Jo I mean, really, I thought those three questions touched on the three key issues that you know one needs to think about to sort of move beyond you know all these these nice models how do you get something that's operational that's going to work how do you change mindsets Wh you know how do you intervene in education and how do you intervene uh, in order to uh, to direct a system if that's what you feel you want to do on the question of intervention I'd say that it's also I think one of the key uh, things to emerge from this way of thinking which is about where you intervene at what level um, that it's you know it's it's not an intervention that says this is what we want to happen and you know that it's a, it's not a top down intervention <coughs> it's about thinking about how mm. can we steer the system by off by changing the ground rules by which the agents involved uh, interact with each other how can we do that in order to get a particular outcome we don't even know i think in many cases whether that's possible but that's the level at which you're intervening it's the level of the the fundamental interactions the between the, the 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 actors really rather than a, a sort of a top-down intervention um but i think uh, maybe also touching on the question of philosophy i think uh, but you know ben you said well first of all we need to understand the science and then we you know we then we hopefully we'll know how to how to apply it i think there's a real tension there because the philosopher Nick Maxwell at uh, UCL has recently been arguing that this is the problem with academia, that actually we're always saying we'll postpone actually doing something that will work until we understand it better. And of course, there's no end to the question of how well we need to understand something. And it's a tricky one because, you know, I I if, if, if you try to do something at too early a stage, um, it can go disastrously wrong. But the, 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 the tendency, I think, certainly within academic thinking is to always put off that problem of, of converting what you've learned about in theory into something that's going to happen in the real world. And I just think, you know, we need to identify that as an issue and to think about how you can, you know, start to instigate change even before you uh, comprehensively understand the system that you're working with. This is something that, of course, biologists and you know medical researchers are having to grapple with all the time. So it's not a new problem. Okay. Well, look. Thank you very much. And uh, sorry, I had to truncate you both, but we're both so excited about it <laughs> that you're answering at length and means that you can't be at quiz further. Um, I contrast the academic dilemma with the one I encountered in when I was chief scientific advisor which is an inference in Whitehall of saying, this is terrible, we must do something. Um, this is something, 
we must do it. <laughs> um, and you will have been be able to observe that activity in that instance in quite a lot of instances of policy, I'm afraid. 